it's almost ideal. like the can't beat them, join them, but they're still trying to beat them to a certain degree. And it's by going even further. What? Okay. What do we do about this? Is there anything? And how can you be on the pro AI side here? <laughs> AI does have a, a bunch of benefits when it's designed for human values and not for the tech, the technocracy and the oligarchs who are you know trying to control everything or sorry, mostly do control everything. Now, this question of whether AI rules us is scientific and headline grabbing, but actually kind of uninteresting. The really interesting question is the tech of AI, which is much more mundane and down to earth, but actually changing the world as we speak. Welcome to episode 144 of the Michaela Peterson podcast. I'm Michaela Peterson with tree allergies. Sorry, I didn't give you guys a podcast last week. I had no voice. Now my voice is kind of back. This might be what I sound like forever. We will see. This is an opposing views episode where I interview two people with vastly different views on a subject. This episode was about artificial intelligence. In this episode of Opposing Views, we discuss the existential risk of AI, job automation, mass surveillance, deep learning, government AI, and the ex-CEO of Google pushing for facial recognition and social credit systems in America. My first guest was the entrepreneur, filmmaker, podcast host, and author, Andrew Keen. Andrew also hosts the award-winning documentary and TV show, How to Fix Democracy, although he wasn't exactly optimistic about fixing America. My second guest was Stephen Umbrello, the managing director at the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies and editor of Ethics and Robotics. Stephen holds a PhD in the ethics and design of AI. He's the one who told me about the ex-Google CEO and what America has planned for its citizens. Dun, dun, dun. Let me know who you found more convincing in the comments section. Or perhaps both guests are right. This episode was sponsored by Schwank Grills. Do you remember the best steak you've ever had? Or are you one of those poor suckers that thinks steaks are supposed to be gray? Well, I'm here to tell you there's hope for you. Let me introduce Schwank Grill's 1500 degree portable infrared grill. These things make anyone look like a natural. They're made in America and the parts are all stainless steel that slide out for easy washing. It even comes with a pizza stone for people who still eat pizza. No, pizza isn't healthy, even in moderation, sorry. But you're still gonna do it so they sent a pizza stone. These grills are perfect for any deck, patio, or backyard, and they cook with the same infrared technology used in professional kitchens like Morton's Steakhouse. If you want to impress people, or if you make your steaks gray anyways, get one of these. They're amazing. Schwank has a great deal for my listeners. Get your very own American-made 1,500-degree infrared grill today at schwankgrills.com. All you need is promo code MP at checkout, to get $150 off your purchase. Again, that's $150 off at schwankgrills.com with code MP, schwankgrills.com, MP. Andrew Keen, welcome to my podcast. Well, thank you so much, Michaela, for inviting me. Uh, before we get started, can you give a brief background about who you are and what it is you do? Uh, I'm an uh, internet entrepreneur based in uh, San Francisco, California, on the edge of Silicon Valley. I have uh, probably the, the world's most viewed daily podcast about books and new writing called Keen On, uh, which you can find on the Lit Hub network. Uh, I'm also the host of How to Fix Democracy, uh, which is uh, my award-winning show and movie about the future of democracy. I've written four books. Uh, and numerous startups. So I do lots of different things. Hey, okay, well, you're on here to talk about AI, the future of AI. Good. Well, always happy to talk about AI, and I am the real Andrew Keen. There's no nothing artificial about me. Or you, I hope, I'm Michaela. Oh, you never know. Actually, I have an artificial hip and an artificial ankle, but they're not learning anything. So. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, okay, so what's your view on AI? Is it a positive? Is it a negative? I think you have to refine that question a little bit more. It's like me saying to you, uh, Michaela, what's your view on the internet or what's your view on life? It's too big a subject. You need to sharpen the question. <laughs> okay, I like you. 
If we have self-learning robots, is it a possibility that they're going to become smarter than us and then view us as a hindrance? I don't think it would be hard, Michaela, for robots to be smarter than us. We're a fairly dumb species. Um, whether we'll become the slaves of them is a really interesting one. I think it's a technological issue, which uh, quite frankly is kind of beyond me. I'm not a technologist. The idea, it, it's an ongoing debate amongst the hardcore scientists who study AI of whether um, we can essentially, by giving uh, AIs, giving robots, giving smart machines the ability to think, whether they can outthink us. And so I, I, you know, philosophically, of course, it's a very sexy idea. It's been the um, subject of many different science fiction writers, the idea of uh, right from the 19th century, in fact, even before the 19th century, the idea of us creating machines, Frankensteins, which come to rule us. Uh, so philosophically, it's fascinating. I think it would be an appropriate end to our species. I think we'd get what we deserve. But uh, in, in technological terms, I'm not quite sure. I, I just don't, I don't understand the, 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 interest, the intricacies of the debate in terms of whether or not we can build machines which then go on to think for themselves and then think beyond us. If we do, then we are the footnote, as somebody famously said, they are our last invention. Uh, so it's, it's impossible to say, and uh, for me at least. And I think the scientific community is very divided. And when you talk to serious scientists rather than people who just seek headlines, um, most of them will say, well, we really, really don't know. It, it's such a complicated subject and, and perhaps a subject which will surprise us because uh, we'll only know when we know. So as I said, you know, maybe you're, maybe you're an AI, maybe I'm an AI. We'll only know when we know. You think and maybe we'll never know. And that will be the, the interesting narrative that uh, we'll get ruled by AIs and we won't even know it. Maybe we already are. Well, that's a horrifying. Well, I don't know. Aren't you happy? You seem, you seem quite a cheerful person. Maybe it's, it, it wouldn't bother me if in the world today, if AIs are ruling, they're not doing a bad job. They could do a lot worse. Oh, sure. I don't know. I just had to move from Canada. I wasn't very happy by how that was being run, but maybe it needs more okay. AI. Oh, you're, job. where are you now? I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. So you went from Canada to Nashville? Yeah. Isn't that going from the frying pan to the fire? Oh, it depends what you identify the fire as. Oh, uh, okay. Okay, so AI. It's in, so it's in the military now. You know, they're using smart machines to track faces and everything, and then each side has their own AI. Um, do you think, so it's already implemented in some areas. Do you think when it gets implemented in factories, this is going to be an issue for factory workers or people who have more automated jobs? Yeah, that's an interesting question. It's already being implemented. I mean, it's when people talk about new tech, when people talk about the internet, when people talk about the next generation technology, some people use the term now Web3 as the next chapter after Web 2.0. It's everywhere. It's ubiquitous. So whenever you're talking about tech or big tech or big tech companies, you're talking about AI. So Amazon, for example, is essentially an AI company. Google is an AI company. Facebook is a good AI company. Even Apple um, is an AI company focusing on hardware. So it's already in factories. If you have the ill fortune of working in an Amazon factory, you're being watched all the time by smart machines. Your ability or inability on the shop floor is being watched. And increasingly, there'll be technologies which are often being championed by tech investors like Jeff Bezos, the founder of, of Amazon, technologies of surveillance, which are designed to make sure that we do our job and to evaluate us and measure us. So uh, I, I don't think of that in futuristic terms. It's, it's already arrived. The really interesting question is when it begins to affect uh, the higher end workers. And I use that term carefully. I'm not sure we're so high end, but whether it's commentators like you or I, whether it's lawyers or doctors or engineers or politicians, but we're in the midst of this revolution and it's a very profound one in terms of the workplace. So for example, mm -hmm. 
there's a big debate, as you know, about whether or not people should go back to the workplace and the office, which is an interesting debate. And it doesn't affect me because I've always worked from home, but a lot of people it does affect. And they think, well, they have more freedom at home, more independence, but actually they don't with all this new technology observing people's work. It doesn't mean just a camera, but it's smart tech, which can determine whether or not we're actually working or doing something else. So all this technology is designed to measure our performance in the workplace and perhaps elsewhere. And it's already arrived. We're in the midst of this revolution. It's a very profound one. It's probably the most profound one of the 21st century. So that's why um, you know, this question of whether AI rules us is scientific and headline grabbing, but actually kind of uninteresting. The really interesting question is, the tech of AI, which is much more mundane and down to earth, but actually changing the world as we speak. So are you talking the tech? Are you referring to things like AI that's able to answer? Well, that's different. That's AI that's used for medicine. Uh, so there's lots of AIs that help engineers and doctors and journalists. I mean, there's AI uh, um, for me as a writer. I mean, it's very basic M AI, but it helps me spell. Um, so that's a different issue. What we're talking about AI in the workplace, it's AI that evaluates our performance. So it goes the other way. AI can be very useful too. I mean, there's no doubt about that. No one would argue against AI that can help fix cancer. Mm hmm but it goes both ways. I mean, the thing with AI is it's so ubiquitous. It's like me saying, you know, are you for or against oxygen? Or are you for or against the internet? Clearly there are arguments for and against, but it's so ubiquitous and essential that it's very easy to make arguments for or against. Do you think there's any way going forward that the government or somebody, I don't know who, could implement policies to stop some of the negatives people are concerned about, about AI in the workplace? Yeah, there will be. But remember, the American government, uh, you're a Canadian immigrant. Um, the American government is profoundly dysfunctional. It has one of the, the least effective governments in the world, uh, staffed by in generally incompetent people because smart Americans don't go into government. It's badly paid and frowned upon in, in, our, in our social hierarchies and culture. So the American government won't be the government that addresses this in the same way as the American government hasn't been the government that addresses the dangers of big tech companies. This will likely be done in two ways, by two kinds of government, by the sort of authoritarian technocracy in China, where they will just announce regulation and legislation of AI, uh, according to sort of some wise man precept, Chinese culture, uh, which has been inherited now by the Chinese Communist Party, and then by the the democracies of Northern Europe, the German government, the Scandinavian government, and the EU government, which I think will do a reasonably good job. Uh, American government is always second or third in this. So eventually, as these threats are regulated and legislated against, so the American government will will pick it up. They've done that with big tech. They're only beginning to address the dangers of big tech now after the Europeans and the Chinese have addressed it. What, what did the Chinese do to address the dangers of big tech? Well, they shut them down. They find them. They put their leaders in jail. I'm not saying it's necessarily a good thing, but that's one effective way of doing it. Chinese have a very strong, effective, functional government, um, whereas the Americans don't, which is why the Chinese economy is stronger. It's why Chinese society is more um, perhaps successful. I wouldn't. I would prefer, I think, personally, to live in the United States. But certainly, China is a more successful society than the United States. Richer, happier people, less crime, less prisons. All, all the indicators, all the indexes, which indicate happiness and success. Is there less poverty there? Much less than in the United States. When was the last time you were in San Francisco, Michaela? It's become a giant homeless years. camp. Yeah, I, have I was just in New York yesterday. It's becoming like San Francisco. Awful. Toronto was like that. That's why I moved. Not as, yeah. bad, as, not as bad as New York, but getting there. Right. Well, how's Nashville? Amazing. 
Yeah. It's no homeless, no poverty. Not really. I mean, there are, there are areas like any, you know, American city, but compared to Toronto, it's much better. People are calm yeah. and happier. Good. I'll have yeah. to come and visit. Yeah, you should. It's pretty nice down here uh, in the middle of America. Uh, okay. What about the fact, so I want to go back to China for a sec. There's an issue with the fact the government has as much power over citizens. So don't you think AI implemented at a government level, surveilling everybody, isn't that an issue, collecting all the data? Oh, it's definitely an issue. I mean, I've written and, and spoken about this a lot. Ch the Chinese are refining what I would call a digital Orwellian state. Um, Orwell, of course, in, in 1948, wrote a book called 1984, which was a warning about, I guess, an analog surveillance state, uh, a sort of Stalinist analog surveillance state, which he thought was coming into being after the Second World War, when Stalinism was the dominant form of government in, in, in Eastern Europe and in the Soviet Union and, and imminently in China. Uh, what the Chinese are doing are refining a kind of techno-capitalist surveillance state where everyone is watched all the time and where the government is controlling the levers, the technologies of surveillance. Yeah, it's, it's terrifying. I don't want to live there. But, it, but it's effective. Whereas in contrast, the American government is um, profoundly dysfunctional and is resulting in a society that's failing. Uh, which as another subject. Your, your fellow countryman, Stephen Marsh, uh, I'm interviewing him next month on my Keenon show. He has a new book out about the imminence of civil war in America. There's going to be a whole rash, and I use that word carefully, of books in the early 2022 about civil war in America, the breakdown of government. I mean, the government's kind of already broken down, but that's not justifying the Chinese system. It's not either or. There are alternatives. Um, and as I said, the European model of a stronger, more functional state with uh, politicians and regulators who are respected. That's probably the best compromise between Chinese techno-authoritarianism and American dysfunctional government. Don't, don't areas of Europe have an immigration problem that's potentially destroying parts of it, though? You mean um, Americans coming over? No, I meant places like Paris and people from North Africa coming over specifically. Well, that's got to do with the government. Well, I mean, immigration policy, wouldn't that be the government? Yeah, I mean, that's another question. I don't think that has anything to do with surveillance culture or the effectiveness of government. Um, and uh, I, I don't think that, um, you know, I think they're, they're different parts of the world. So the issue of immigration in Europe and in, in, in North America is different. But yeah, I don't think that's got anything to do with it. I don't think it has anything to do with surveillance, but I was commenting on how effective the government was for building a society. <sighs> yeah, but the European model still works and is still trying to be emulated around the world, whereas the American, North America, the United States one isn't. America is a joke around the world. The American, the dysfunctionality of American society and government now is, is perhaps the dominant theme of, of early 21st century, the global world. They're laughed at around the world because the system doesn't work and the country is on the brink of civil war. Uh, that's a different issue from having an immigration policy problem, which of course it does have. You said you've written books on how to fix democracy. I've made a film about how to fix democracy. And so do you have a solution for America that can avoid civil disaster? No, I think America is beyond hope, actually, I'm afraid. It's, uh, I'm about to do an interview on my show with Eric Topol, you know, the leading, one of America's leading doctors. And I think America is the equivalent of that corpse or almost corpse that's about to die. And there's not much you can do about it, I'm afraid. Well, do you have a plan? Are you going to stay here and watch the collapse or are you moving? No, it doesn't bother uh, coastal elites like myself. We fly in and out. Doesn't make a difference. It's not going to be full civil war, full scale civil war like in the 19th century. It will be 
outbreak. I mean, it's already kind of. I mean, this is a, 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 this is separate from AI, but it will be a low level kind of civil war, the sort of Lebanese style, or it's not going. I don't think it will be like Syria. Uh, but basically, a government breakdown, sort of eruptions of violence around the country. It's not going to affect New York or San Francisco or Los Angeles, but it still will result in the breakdown ultimately of, of, of order. It's this book by Stephen Marsh is really good. He he does an excellent job. Uh, I read it a couple of weeks ago. It's out in early January. You should get him on your show. Stephen Marsh, I'm writing that down. M A R C A H E. Okay. Fascinating. Okay. You're a very interesting character. I'm kind of upset I brought you on to talk about AI. <laughs> Why? Well, I don't know. We could be talking about the crash of civilizations. That's well, we really are. Hard. We are. Maybe I'm an AI designed to upset you. AI so is part of it all as well. You know, AI is um, is a piece of the narrative. It's a chapter in the breakdown. Relying on machines, which don't do a very good job generally. Yeah, you know, I had to talk to one on a phone yesterday. To you did? Credit card. Oh, yeah, it was awful. Yeah. Yeah, I always That's put the phone down. Whenever you talk to, if, if you, I think we all have to uh, agree that whenever you're talking to an A, if you put the phone down enough times, eventually their masters and they remain humans will, um, will get the message and put real people on. Yeah, or press zero enough times. That sometimes works. Although, if you you never know, Michaela, if you do it enough times, you may get one of those immigrants from Europe, one of those North Africans who you don't like. <laughs> they'll be on the phone with you. They'll know who you are. They'll be calling you all the time. I don't know if Mohammed from Tangiers will be onto Michaela. I still think that there's an immigration policy problem in some. Another in show. Have me back on. We can have a serious <laughs> okay. chat about that. Okay. Okay. I will for sure. So do you, so the, the guy I talked to who was more, you know, this is going to happen. AI is going to become a thing. But I'm not saying it isn't. I've, I've said it's going to happen. It's inevitable. But do you think they're actually going to be able to make machines that can outthink humans? Well, you asked me that before. <sighs> I, I think you've got to rephrase the question because from a technological point of view, I'm not able to answer that. So maybe if you rephrase it, would I, would I like to have machines that can outthink humans? Maybe ask me okay. that. Okay. Would you like to have machines that can outthink humans? I, I shouldn't say this, but, I, but since I, you have a pretty big audience, I'm not sure if anyone's going to be watching this. As soon as they see me, they'll probably switch off. But um <laughs> I would like to have machines that outthink humans. I think we're such a pathetic species that it would actually be amusing. I'm not sure how we'd react. Maybe it would get us to grow up and think a bit more responsibly. But I don't think it would necessarily be a bad thing. It'd be interesting. I mean, maybe they'd be wiser, more humane. Who knows? I mean, the, the idea of the kind of the hardcore AI community is we could fill these algorithms with our best qualities. So we could make them human. We could make them sympathetic. Mm -hmm. We could make them smart. Um, and I guess that's possible. The problem is whenever you hear those arguments, and, and maybe there's some truth in them, they're always going to be owned by humans. So it's like the Google argument or the Facebook argument. Oh, we're going to make the world a better place. We're going to liberate. We're going to democratize. We're going to decentralize. We're going to empower. And all those things may be true of social media and ubiquitous search and Amazon. But ultimately, these products and services and platforms have human masters. So the problem with making an AI that's smarter than us, more sympathetic, more responsible, wiser, is it will still have human masters who will profit economically, politically, culturally. So that's the really scary thing about dominant AIs. You have it in Silicon Valley. You have this, it was, uh, you know, I've been, I've been living here since for the last 30 or 40 years, and I've seen it time after time after time. Technology is saying, oh, now we have the fix. Now we have the solution. Now we have technology that will essentially make us better that will take our best bits mm -hmm. and, and, and liberate us from our bad bits. 
And sometimes that's true. We've seen it with social media. Uh, we heard all the arguments. Oh, well, big media is bad. It's controlled by these people. No one has a voice. So we gave everyone a voice. We gave them a platform. We even made it free. And look what's happened. We've had the destruction of democracy. We've had basically <laughs> online civil war, the breakdown of civility. Uh, and the biggest problem of all is there is a young man, and he remains a young man, who owns this AI. His name is Mark Zuckerberg, and he's made tens, hundreds of billions of dollars off this AI. The same is true of Google and Amazon and Facebook and all the rest of these companies. So the real problem with AI is not the AI itself. It's who owns it. Yeah. So, so the, the vision that some people have, which I don't believe, I don't know how it works, is to have an open source platform, you know, uh, uh, a Bitcoin blockchain style AI that's owned by everyone collectively. But those things never work. Ultimately, it's like those free credit card offers or those people who are calling you when you when you talk to your credit card companies. The promise and the reality are entirely different. So whenever there's a promise of everything's free and everything's perfect and we're in control, I'm always deeply suspicious. I was suspicious 20 years ago about Web 2.0, and I was proved right. I was one of the first people to raise a warning about uh, social media and Web 2.0. And I think that the same is true of AI. The same is true of Bitcoin and blockchain. When you listen to these promises, oh, well, we're going to liberate currency from the central banks. Everyone now will earn currency. There'll be no, no more money. It will be a P2P economic system. The truth is, is there are still speculators and owners of these products. And the same will be true of AI. And I don't see any way that AI can really become a public good unless it's controlled by government. And then we come back to our earlier conversation. We have the, 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 the truly dystopian Chinese model where the government owns AI and controls it for its own benefit. Or we have a, 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 the American model where government is just dysfunctional, nothing happens. So everything is controlled by private companies. Or we have an, a European model that tries to mix the two and have a, an authoritative government, which still acts in a responsible democratic way. So that's the challenge. You have all these new AI platforms. Um, and they're all promising some sort of openness. When anyone, when anyone, Michaela, comes on your show and uses the O word, open, be suspicious, because nothing is ever truly open. There's always someone owning it behind it. So the open word, the O word, uh, open, is always really about ownership. And we can't, and, and my fear with AI is we're never going to get beyond ownership. There will always be someone who owns it. There'll always be some smart human, maybe a James Bond evil character, a Zuckerberg style character, a Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk who own this stuff and are getting enormously rich off it and enormously powerful. And that's, from my point of view, uh, it's chilling, particularly when they articulate the double speak of Silicon Valley and promise to make the world a better place. But in truth, they're only making the world a better place for themselves and their investors and workers. Okay. I think we're pretty much in agreement. My, my concern. We was, are. Yeah. I didn't I, come I, on to no, agree with I you. I, well, I'm, I'm sorry. What about those Muslims, those dangerous Muslims on the well, border? You said we have to do that in another podcast. Okay. We'll do that. In another one. We should. Um, I think my concern with AI would be somebody controlling it who thinks that they're doing something good for the world and really truly believes that they yeah. aren't because you don't have evil people. You don't have, I don't think you really have evil people. I think you have people who think they're doing good and then do evil, which is yeah, way there was scarier. A, a, yeah. There was a wonderful book. One of perhaps the most profound 20th century American thinker on tech and big tech companies was a, a man who taught at New York university called um, Neil Postman. And in 1984, which of course was the year that Orwell predicted his 1984 would come into being. Uh, Postman wrote a book called Amusing Ourselves to Death. Oh. And, and in that introduction, it's a wonderful introduction, it's only about four or five pages. He says, we all got it wrong. The real danger in 1984 wasn't Orwell's 1984. It was Brave New World. It was Aldous Huxley's dystopia. 
of a, a, a techno authoritarianism. And I think he's right. And I think the book uh, for your viewers, um, if you want to really worry about the future, don't read 1984, read Brave New World, uh, uh, Huxley's, I think it was 1934 warning about a world saturated with technology, a world in which government uses technology to make everyone happy. Yeah, I read that in high school. That was a scary book. Too much pleasure, right? Too much pleasure. And then the force of no pain. It's a, it's a dystopian utilitarianism. And of course, um, it's one in which everyone is intoxicated. A government which gives out pills to make people forget. Um, and, and, and I'm afraid, you know, that's what social media is. And that's what, that's the world we're living in. It's very different from, say, the Chinese model. China isn't doing that. I mean, China is kind of mixed. The Chinese digital totalitarian system is a mix of Orwell and Huxley. It's as if the leader of China, maybe like at you, read in high school both Brave New World and 1984 and said, well, I don't want, I'm going to get them both. And that's what they're doing in China. You think that kind of system is going to outlast the US? Yeah, it's a much more successful system. If you're if you're a, um, a government leader or um, wannabe politician in Central or Latin America, in Africa, in, in, in most of South Asia, and you think, okay, well, which model are we going to choose? Are we going to choose the dysfunctionality of America on the brink of civil war for a city like San Francisco, which is dominated by homeless people, or the Chinese model that works? It may not be very pleasant may not be very moral, but it works. I've done a lot of speeches around the world on tech. And I was at the UN just before COVID doing a speech to the, the, the assembly there on the dangers of Web 2.0 uh, and the dangers of big tech in America. And the, 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 the people who were most sympathetic to what I was saying were many of the delegates from Africa. You know, back in the, the old Cold War, Cold War 1.0 in the late, you know, in the late 19th, 20th century, the, the Western model worked. No one wanted to go and live in the Soviet Union. It was dysfunctional. It was dark. It didn't work. Everyone lived in poverty. Everything was unpleasant. But the Chinese model is a much more effective model than the US model. So that's the challenge is we got to come up with a model that can compete with China, which isn't as autocratic, isn't as evil, isn't as unpleasant. And is it going to be the business owners who do that, considering the government's dysfunctional? It may be the business go the owners. So, you know, I've had a lot of people on my show talking about social capitalism. It may be reforming democracy itself, citizen assemblies, reforming government. One of the biggest problems in America is just the, the political system is archaic. It's built on an 18th century rural country that no longer exists. So we need profound reform. Maybe we need to unleash the citizen. Um, they're doing that again in Europe. They're doing it with citizen assemblies. They're doing it in Canada. They're not doing it in the United States. So America, for all its um, forwardness and innovation when it comes to tech, is profoundly reactionary and conservative when it comes to any kind of institutional or constitutional reform. Okay. Well, I'd love to keep talking to you. I don't want to keep you on because I know you have something to do. Yeah. we're well, lovely talking to you, Michaela, and we'll have to come on again and talk about those immigrants in Europe. I would really enjoy that. Uh, if, if people want to find you, if they don't people follow you. People want to find I me. Um, I'm everywhere. Uh, and nowhere uh, like AI, uh, you know, you, I'm AJ Keen on Twitter. Uh, uh, follow, uh, follow my Keen on show. Uh, it's, um, uh, it's of course you can find it anywhere on Apple. It's on lit hub. It's the, one of the, the, the featured shows on, on lithub.com. I have a Substack page called Keen on, uh, I'm not on Facebook because I don't like Facebook. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn, so I'm easy to find. I'm ajkeen.com on the web. So it's a real pleasure. I enjoyed this conversation, Michaela, and thank you so much. Thank you very much for coming on. This episode was brought to you by NordVPN. Have you ever worried about things like, is my data secure when on public Wi-Fi? Or what if somebody steals my identity? Don't be that person. That would be a neurotic person. I'm certainly not, but I may be so unconcerned I go too far in the wrong direction. 
To get the best protection against cybercrime, NordVPN's new threat protection feature blocks trackers, ads, and malware lurking online. It's a brand new feature of NordVPN and comes absolutely free. Most people know about NordVPN. I probably don't have to tell you guys it's the fastest VPN on the planet. But did you know it's the safest as well? NordVPN uses the same encryption standard as top secret NSA files, and they have a strict no log policy on your data, which is why they're headquartered in Panama. It's a Panama law thing, apparently. But most importantly, NordVPN can be used to bypass countries and companies that are stopping you from accessing videos and content online, like Serbia blocking Disney, hotels blocking certain YouTube videos, and Canada blocking anything remotely good on Netflix. Grab your exclusive NordVPN deal by going to nordvpn.com slash TMPP to get a huge discount off your NordVPN plan plus free threat protection plus one additional month for free. It's completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. That's at nordvpn.com slash TMPP. I hope you enjoy the rest of this episode. Stephen Umbrella, welcome to my podcast. Thank you for having me. Before we get started, can you give my audience a brief intro about who you are and what you do? Sure. I'm the, right now the managing director for the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies, which is a 501c3 nonprofit think tank out of Boston. And our general aim is to promote ideas about how technological progress can increase freedom, happiness, uh, and human flourishing in democratic societies. And I'm also a research fellow at the Delft University of Technology, where right now I'm working on creating stakeholder meetings for technologies like geoengineering, neurotechnologies, and digital extended reality. And wow. aside from yeah, that academic stuff, I'm the editor of uh, the, robot, the Ethics and Robotics series with Tribe and Publishing, where my forthcoming book, Designed for Death, uh, will be coming out soon. Designed for death. Okay. Mm. That sounds intriguing. So you're of the opinion that AI isn't going to take over the world and then destroy us eventually? No, absolutely not. <laughs> but okay. It also Why is that? The, well, it, first of all, we have to, I think we're a lot of source where a lot of confusion comes from in both the academic and particularly in public conversations on AI is, well, what is AI exactly? Because it's yeah. kind of like a buzzword right now that everyone likes to use. Uh, and the issue is, th is that there's no agreed upon definition of actually what AI is like globally. So I'd argue if I were to give a definition that it would be best understood as a class of technologies that are autonomous, they're interactive, so we can interact with them. They're adaptive, so they can learn to new situations, uh, new challenges in their environments. And they're capable of carrying out human-like tasks. And in particular, when we use the word AI and that definition, it's mostly those technologies which are based on machine learning, which allows the system to learn on the basis of their interaction with and feedback from their environment. So I would say that that would probably be the simplest way of understanding what AI systems are, but there's actually the European Commission actually recently came out with, uh, and they're well aware of this issue, uh, a draft legislation for artificial intelligence. And it's for promoting uptake of AI and addressing the risks associated with the new technology. And they actually came up with a, a pretty good uh, definition of AI. And that's probably what would be the benchmark from now on of what AI is. What I want to start with, I think, is uh, if AI continues to be implemented, is it going to end up taking jobs away from people who do kind of, not to, to call it menial tasks, but repetitive tasks? And is that going to be an issue? Yeah, I think this will undoubtedly be the case. And we've already seen how the various industrial revolutions from mechanization and electricity to telecommunications, electronics, and more recently, obviously big data, AI, and the internet. And these revolutions naturally come with huge shifts in labor and production. Uh, we can think back to the English textile workers of the 19th century that destroyed their machinery, in particular the cotton and wool mills. 
uh, that they believed were threatening their jobs. And these people are called uh, the Luddites. And now we use that term to refer to someone who's opposed to uh, new technologies and associated ways of working with those technologies that are substitutive. And the IET where I work is actually doing a lot of research on this particular topic. And in actually in collaboration with the University of Massachusetts, Boston, the IET hired actually its first postdoctoral fellow in the future of work to explore questions surrounding technological unemployment, which is essentially the question that you just asked, and how to address it. And looking at questions like if automation is liberating us from the drudgery or just exacerbating inequalities. And I think yeah. the next few years of this research is going to be pretty interesting. So anybody who's interested in that should just keep an eye out on the work we're doing because we'll publish it. Interesting. Okay. I suppose the argument might be that if some of those jobs go away, humanity will adapt, right, in some way that maybe we can't even imagine at the moment. The the not imagine at the moment, perhaps. Um, I think that that comes with uh, an underlying presumption that um, AI needs to substitute. Now, of course, it will substitute to a certain degree because we've already seen that in the, in the other industrial revolutions, how that's changed. And, you know, there's some jobs that simply do not exist anymore. And unfortunately, that means there's certain jobs that may not exist anymore in going into the future. And that's going to be a serious question that we don't really have a solid answer to is what are we going to do with the people that are going to be displaced? Because there will be a certain portion of the population that will be displaced. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Well, I guess we'll see what happens. Do you, when do you think that's going, that kind of thing is going to happen? I mean, it's already happening, but is there going to be a period in the next 10 years when that's going to pose a significant problem? I don't think it'll pose a significant problem if we readjust the way that we, we look at AI. So if we have this uh, active attempt at creating artificial intelligence systems with the purpose of substituting humans rather than trying to empower people, uh, rather than try to augment uh, what they're already capable of. So these are systems that work alongside humans in order to mm. increase their capabilities. Then perhaps we will increasingly face the issue of technological unemployment. But if we shift, if we have a paradigm shift in the way we actually look at AI and understand it as being um, supplementary to human labor in order to increase our productivity and, al and also perhaps our well-being, then perhaps we won't face as much of that particular, uh, that particular element of AI substituting people of technological unemployment. Yeah, I guess that would have to be implemented at the government level, probably. Otherwise, corporations are going to be like, nah, we don't need workers. we will just well, buy this program. It'll do everything. We see that already, don't we, to a certain degree? Yeah, definitely. Cool. It sounds like a fun job, kind of. It's very interesting. Uh, do you think there's there are issues with uh, artificial intelligence impacting privacy and data? Oh, wow. Uh, I would say that we can rephrase that per, uh, a little bit and say, uh, what do we do about the privacy issues that we have now given in terms of how governments control AI systems and systems more broadly, because there's already issues that perhaps they will be exacerbated. I think they will be, but there's already issues with uh, governments controlling AI systems. So, you know, China is the classic example. And naturally the, the corporate media is more than willing to saber rattle and push the narrative, despite the fact that the Chinese state does employ these methods. Still, it shouldn't dis distract us the, the very real example of China and what they're doing from what's actually going on right now on the home front. I'm not sure if you've heard, but back in 2019, uh, the organization called EPIC, which is the Electronic, uh, Electronic Privacy Information Center, uh, filed, strangely enough, successfully a freedom of information request to the U.S. government. And they got a bunch of documents back revealing how the National Security Commission on AI, which is, well, a relatively n little known body, I never really heard of it before this, uh, which was created uh, with the 2018 NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act. Um, and it these documents revealed how artificial intelligence can address, and this is, quote, uh, the national security and defense needs of the United States. And it discusses even further the structural changes that need to be made in both American economy and society 
to ensure that the U.S. maintains a technological advantage over China. So, you know, what is you that go, supposed okay. to mean? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you go, OK, that makes sense, given what China is doing. We want to you know, stay on top. And that's what America does. But the document is actually pretty scary in terms of the suggestions that are made. They argue that the U.S. should adopt a China style mass surveillance program in order to lead or even surpass China concerning AI driven technologies like facial recognition and citizen scoring, which is actually what's prohibited in that European regulation that I mentioned before, that type of technology. And funny, although unsurprising, the, that US body responsible for these proposals that was gotten through this uh, FOIA uh, is chaired by the former head of Google, Eric Schmidt, where it further goes- This is crazy. In, yeah, and it further goes into how the regu- this is what the document says, that the regulatory barriers need to be removed on emerging AI technologies. And it even goes so far as to boldly say that existing privacy laws need to be changed so that the U.S. government can do all of that, what I just said, more openly, whereas up until now, they've been doing it secretly to citizens. Wow, that's crazy. Welcome to the dystopian nightmare that people have been talking about for years now. Oh, my gosh. Okay, what do you think is going to happen? Like how much power does that tiny unknown, what would you, what would you refer to that? Not bored. What did you call it? What was the acronym? Uh, yeah. Uh, the, that, that, that government body, the, yeah. nas- the national security commission on AI. Okay. And <laughs> so is that actually going to happen? Like, is that already happening? If what Edward Snowden reveal is any indication of what's been going up and on until now, it seems that's exactly what will probably happen. We're already seeing the kind of infrastructure being put into place that allows for this. I saw uh, someone from uh, one of the central banks in Canada discussing digital ID uh, and you know saying how secure it is. Nothing is fully secure, but it allows the government to close your bank accounts. We, we see what the tyrant in Canada has already done to certain citizens in their bank accounts. So I, I think the precedent has already been set. Oh my gosh. Well, this was more dramatic than I thought it was going to be. So is there, any, I, I mean, I guess I can understand if I, not that I agree with it, but I can understand if the government is concerned about China just overtaking and they're like, well, we'll just do it, but better, which is not it. It's almost like the can't beat them, join them, but they're still trying to beat them to a certain degree. And it's by going even further. What? Okay. What do we do about this? Is there anything? And how can you be on the pro AI side here? (laughs) AI does have a, a bunch of benefits when it's designed for human values and not for the tech, the technocracy and the oligarchs who are, you know, trying to control everything or sorry, mostly do control everything. What can be done about that right now? Well, first of all, I think most people need to know what's going on. And I think to a certain degree, people like yourself who spread these kinds of messages or allow people to discuss these things. For example, I would suggest that people who are interested in this particular uh, issue right here, what's going on in the United States, uh, they should check out uh, the great journalism being done by Whitney Webb, who's taken a lot of care uh, to documents like this and these issues, she's watching the watchers essentially, despite the risks that come with this kind of journalism. She's definitely an excellent resource. Okay. Wow. That's terrifying. Okay. So we're, we're basically screwed then though, aren't we? I mean, because it's not going to be designed to help people. Like, that's not what's going to happen. What do you think? Not the systems that they're discussing. No, not unless there's uh real populist resistance against these things, but you cannot have that resistance unless people know about it. Wow. George Orwell will be rolling in his grave. If you heard this, cause this is something beyond 1984. Wow. That's terrifying. Okay. Okay. So how could then let's go in a more positive direction for now, mm-hmm. although we'll probably go back to that. Cause that's kind of fun, but how could AI be designed going forward so that it doesn't end up just destroying everyone's privacy and we don't turn into China? 
Okay. Well, that, that's actually like two different uh, particulars because there's what's already being done at the government level in harnessing the power of AI. And then there's more of that, the design level in how can we design safe, reliable and trustworthy AI and these separate, slightly separate domains. If you're asking me about the former of what do we do about what the government wants to do? Well, I think that that's at a, more at a, at a national level of what do the people want, right? And like I mentioned, they have to know about what's going on before they can actually say what they want. So these things are currently not transparent. I'm actually surprised that the FOIA request was granted. I think that's almost crazy. But then again, it does state that they want to do this openly. So it's not even one, it's not a secret anymore, nor is it a conspiracy when we have the FOIA documents, you know, they're published online and it even says within them, they want to do it publicly. But if we go to the design side, I think there are ways of designing safe, reliable, and trustworthy AI. And I can give you just like a few examples if you want. Um, so there's this, um, there's something called Z inspection. And it's a process that has the potential, I think, to play a key role uh, in the context of the new European Union's AI regulation that I mentioned. And essentially, it's an initiative of a team of in international independent researchers, and I work with them. Uh, which takes real life case studies of AI, such as certain AI systems in the healthcare domain, and they apply this process uh, as a way of achieving trustworthy AI. And it's a general inspection process. So we look at something that already exists, an AI system that already exists, and we look at um, how can we apply ethical AI to them in a variety of domains like business, healthcare, public sectors, and we use the definition of trustworthy AI that's given by the high level uh, European Commission's expert group on AI. But we actually even go beyond uh, the key elements that the European Union asks for. And we provide an additional two more. One of them is assessing if the ecosystems respect the values of Western European democracy and whether we can avoid a concentration of power. That's what we just discussed, the concentration of power. You know? Uh, so, for example, we took a close look at a deep learning based uh, skin lesion classifier to see how we can use the process to co-design in such a way as to make it trustworthy. So the system explains decisions made by deep learning networks, analyzing images of skin lesions. And this is an example of what we call computer aided diagnostic systems or CAD systems. And they've, they've been shown to yield higher sensitivity and specificity in diagnosing uh, malignant melanoma by analyzing uh, dermatostopic pictures compared to well-trained dermatologists. So they actually show efficacy Fantastic. even beyond. Yeah, but, and this is usually the, the cause of hesitancy when employing these type of AI systems like this, is the acceptance of these CAD systems in real clinical setups is actually quite limited. So it hasn't been uptaken at large scales. And that's because their decision-making processes, how it actually makes decisions are more often than not largely obscure. And that's because there's a lack of explainability. It's what we call black box. We don't know what's going inside the black box. Cool. Um, yeah. But you know, we argue that in order for to, in order to co-design trustworthy AI with a holistic approach means that we need some unique aspects, uh, aspects in the structure and in the design process, or more specifically, we need an interdisciplinary team of experts coming from the domain of the AI application. So in this case with the CAD system, that would be the field of healthcare, um, as well as other fields like the technical side, the legal side, the social and ethical side. So we need an interdisciplinary team working together to uncover what the issues are and then working with the design team in order to address these issues. So it's a collaborative co-constructed effort. And that's just one of the many frameworks that has been proposed for actually achieving reliable, safe, and trustworthy AI. Okay. So that makes sense. That's interesting. Yeah. So AI can be used in medical set. Us medical settings much more effectively, right? Because they probably have better pattern recognition. They can just contain more data than people. Yeah. So AI systems in healthcare definitely can be used to assist healthcare workers in their, you know, day-to-day -day work, what you would consider perhaps to be slight drudgery, right? Or routine things. And ideally it could be leveraged to enhance preventative care and quality of life, as well as produce more accurate diagnoses and treatment plans. 
But recently, there's been issues regarding this. The proper design of systems could significantly increase the quality of medical care. So, for example, back in 2017, there was actually a study in the Journal uh, of the American Medical Association where an AI model was able to accurately diagnose breast cancer at a higher rate than 11 top pathologists. So it, it definitely is possible. Great. And there's, That's good, there's significant benefits. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So is that... Why hasn't that been put in? You said this, you talked about it a little bit, but why hasn't that been put in the medical system? Is it just slow? Unfortunately, there has been um, some pushback from the, the medical field, given their the general hesitancy of AI systems more broadly. And although it is true that medical, um, although it's true that AI systems, particularly within popular media have shown to be mm, less than uh, accurate in certain circumstances. Uh, certain medical experts are, you know, less than happy to fully trust the system. And when, when you don't, when you ask the system or when you look at the system, when an, a medical expert, like a doctor goes, okay, it showed me that there's this malignant melanoma. I want to know why, why the system told me this particularly if it's not 100% accurate, we're never going to get that 100% accuracy. We want progress, not perfection. So there's always going to be a certain amount of doubt. And when there is an amount of doubt, which is fine, and you can't figure out why the system made the decision that it did the black box, then you're far less likely to actually trust the system. Okay. That makes sense. Do you view the human brain as something that can be replicated with AI? Hmm. So replicated fully, no, it, because it depends exactly what you mean. Uh, our brain is wetware, but if we're talking in silicone, not exactly. So what you're perhaps asking is about deep learning and deep learning is actually a further subfield of machine learning. And it's usually understood and inspired by how the human brain functions and uses what is often referred to as artificial neural networks. So, you know, in order to simulate how our brain works, but in silicone. So essentially it works by learning from examples in a similar way that actually humans learn new things. They're yeah. actually, yeah, they're actually pretty good uh, systems and they work great at classifying images actually quite accurately in text and sounds. And they can even perform at levels better than humans can at doing that task. So, you know, one of their main benefits like machine learning more broadly, because deep learning is a type of machine learning, is that these systems are capable of computing huge, vast quantities of data that would be impossible to compute with traditional methods in a coherent way. And more traditional techniques of machine learning are pretty linear, whereas deep learning neural networks are stacked in hierarchies of different levels of abstraction. So imagine we want to teach like a deep learning system what a car is. Well, how does a, a kid, like a child, learn what a car is and what a car is not? Because that's also part of what, learning what a car is, what it isn't. Well, the child can, you know, point at the car and say, that's a car. And then the parent can either say, yes, that's a car or no, that's not a car. And as the child continues to point at different cars, they're able to abstract from all those experiences, the features of what a car isn't and what a, and what a car is. And I guess you say that's kind of like the platonic carness in essence that they're, that they're okay. extracting. So, yeah. yeah. Deep, deep, certain, uh, deep learning systems work, work in this way very similar to the way we would learn or we tried to mimic that in silicone. Okay. And do you see that progressing to the point where it's comparable to a human? No. Uh, I, I, I have a hard time with uh, the concept of AI uh, being anthropomorphized too far. Hmm. Uh, the classic okay. Terminator scenario, you know, yeah. is AI a, a threat to humanity, right? Taking over. We see the images all the time on magazines and movies. I love those movies. They're great. Uh, but I, I have a really hard time uh, with, with that particular way of uh, conceiving of, uh, of AI. And if you want, I can tell you why. Yeah. Yeah. I do want to know why. Well, you know, if we take that, that definition of AI that I gave at the beginning as, as our starting point, it's hard to imagine that the thing that that type of thing is taking over anything or being a significant global threat. And usually the discussions of AI as being as a threat to humanity or as 
you know, on an existential level is referring to speculative artificial general intelligence or artificial super intelligence, something out of Hollywood. And Nick Bostrom, actually, a uh, professor at the University of Oxford in his book called Super Intelligence, talks about this. But despite, you know, the popular media having their fun with, with this, it's not a really realistic picture of what AI is. It's, it's just not. It puts the wrong idea of what AI is in people's minds and this kind of embodied mechanistic God that can do anything because it's more intelligent than us. But we're so far removed from that kind of scenario that talking about it amounts to nothing more than having fun. And I, I think it's actually worse than that. Talking about AI like that does more harm than good. Like for one, there's the risk that the public will see these futuristic ideas of AI, whether good or bad, and create pretty big expectations in their minds about what AI is and what it can do. And this is actually pretty bad for AI research because it can lead to another, what would be the third AI winter. And these are freezes in serious AI research and development, uh, hence the winter part and the freezes, that come as a consequence of overly ambitious promises that AI can yield with the actual results being pretty humbler than expectations. And this happened in the mid seventies and in the late eighties, early nineties. And it's the perceptual loss in faith of what AI can do that leads to the actual loss in funding uh, to do this research. And, you know, we're living in kind of like this Renaissance of sorts where everything is AI, which is of course nonsense, but what it does reveal is that there's, you know, pretty big global interest in the capabilities that AI can offer us. Still, you'd think we'd you know, learn our lesson by now, but these kinds of exaggerated illustrations of AI in popular cu uh, culture can eventually blow up uh, in our faces. And there's also another danger, and worrying about the risks of artificial general or artificial superintelligence leads us to be distracted from the actual issues that AI systems pose. And the, the most common, of course, is bias in these systems. And bias can exist across all levels and all stages of how an AI system is conceived, trained, built, and used. Uh, so we have to address these concerns head on if we want to build AI for social good, AI for people, rather than have you know, to constantly read headlines about how AI uh, systems reinforce discrimination or existing spheres of disproportionate influence and power. Okay. Well, I feel somewhat better with that answer. I can get rid of the Arnold Schwarzenegger taking over the world type robot. That's good. But the real problem is people who get their hands on this and then everything's destroyed because of what they do with it, which is equally as scary. Yeah. It's that dual use of technology. Not everyone uses a technology the way the designers originally intended. Yeah. Like, like okay. the, think um, about the government that I mentioned. Yeah, we're going to get back into that because I want to talk about exactly what China is doing. Um, mm -hmm. But before we do that, um, what what did you mean by built-in bias? Can you give some examples of what that could look like? Sure. Yeah, definitely. So um, let's take the mortgage industry, for example. So you know, obviously how an AI functions in the real world is a consequence of, well, the people who made it, the designers, its creators. So there's actually numerous examples of how a flawed algorithm leads to, well, faulty outputs, right? If it's faulty from the beginning, it's going to be faulty, you know, when it's actually being used. So when the designers create software programs, these programs are constrained within specific parameters, and it's the nature of those parameters to be the subject of interpretation. So for example, if someone from a low-income neighborhood submitted a mortgage proposal, there's a good chance that that proposal would be classified by the system as high risk. And as a consequence, the system will recommend a high interest rate in order to account for that risk that the firm is going to have to shoulder. And the unfortunate thing is that these neighbor how these neighborhoods are divided are actually has little to do with how income is generated and more about the social economic factor. So, you know, things like race, for example, and these systems aren't capable of recognizing this bias. It can only account for and compute the information based on its design. And this usually ends with a, you know, a firm's agent lacking proper justification when they have to reject the client. And this is the black box again. Why was I rejected? I don't know. And you know, this can lead to what I would say is deleterious uh, impacts on the firm's reputation. 
given that people can quickly spread the word of how they were rejected, but they weren't given a clear reason as to why. Mm. Yeah, that wouldn't be good. If if you want to see some great bias in facial recognition, uh, that's also a fun one. There's a whole host of examples. So like a few years ago in New Jersey, there was a man that was arrested by police and actually spent time in jail when they followed what they called a high profile comparison from a a facial recognition scan that they extracted from a fake ID that they found at the crime scene. And the machine learning algorithm that they used in the facial recognition system learned to identify a person based on their facial features. And these programs have been shown in a number of studies to be less than reliable, uh, to say the least. And they're certainly less than accurate in their ability to properly identify particularly Black and Asian faces. I remember there was one where Google, uh, one of Google facial uh, image classifier classified uh, black males as gorillas in the same category. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That is not what we want. No, definitely not. Okay. So could that go, I, th- I want to get back into China, what China's doing, mm-hmm. but could we end up with AI systems that are completely, you know, the population is completely entrenched in this. And then you end up getting these kind of mistakes where you identify people improperly. And then that ends up ruining lives because AI has said, oh no, you know, with 99.9% certainty, this is the guy you want. And then that's it. Life over. This is uh, the classic example. You essentially just defined what we call the Colin Ridge dilemma, which is we can't understand the full impacts of a technology until it's ubiquitous and therefore pervasive. So it becomes kind of like part of the social technical infrastructure around us. So it's like normalized. But once those things emerge, it's so entrenched that how do we actually go back? Because it's so fundamental yeah. because technologies don't come from nothing, right? They build on previous iterations and then they slowly become normalized as they become diffused in society. So that's one of the reasons why we have to adopt a design approach from the get-go that does at least two things. So one of them is that we have to design technologies for human values, and that means we have to enroll as many stakeholders as possible. That's not only the designer who goes, I'm going to build this system, and you know the CEO goes, we're trying to make profits. Those are important stakeholders. Those are direct stakeholders. But we also have to bring the publics in because in the end, the public is going to be the users, um, the environment, whatever it may be, are going to be the ones that are fundamentally impacted by these technologies. So they have to also be part of the design program itself in designing these technologies. What are their values? How can we design for them rather than sidelining them or as an after fact? And I think that's gener- mm-hmm. that's good a good rule for most technologies, if not all. But AI, we have to add something even further, is a good way to conceptualize how to design AI for social good is to get away from this idea that AI is simply a product. So, you know, a designer makes something, then they sell it, and then like they kind of just wash their hands of it. Like no more of that. Is we have to build in full life cycle monitoring. So because many of these technologies are black box, we don't know why they do what they do in many cases, even if they could be trustworthy. That means that when we throw them out in the world, they're most more likely than not to display emergent behaviors that were unforeseen or even unforeseeable. Uh, And if some of those behaviors that are unforeseen or unforeseeable aren't ones that we like, we need a way to one, recognize them and two have the mechanisms to kind of rein things in, to pull them back into the design space, to do another iteration of design, a firmware update or a software update, whatever it may be. It's no more, let's build this, let's sell it and we're done that's not going to work anymore, given that these are technologies that really do change over time. I'm less confident about humanity's ability to do this than I was at the beginning of this conversation, just so you know. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, let's, uh, let's get back to China. I've got, I've got a couple of questions. But one, if the US doesn't do this kind of competitive thing they're doing where we're going to do that, but better, um, What's your opinion on the likelihood of China just being so effective at this that they do become more and more and more powerful? So are you asking me more about what's going to happen with the future of China? Because essentially you described what happens when China has essentially global dominance. Uh, Well, if uh, if the U.S. doesn't 
Like if mm-hmm. they decide, okay, no, we don't want to go the same route as China. Do you think China's just going to yeah. become world dominant? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, oh, for sure. Okay. We see that already in Europe. You know, Europe, uh, we've been criticized. Uh, that's where I am right now. We've been criticized as having the religion of privacy, right? Uh, yeah. And, you know, the, the, the new uh, European Commission's uh, regulations on AI, once passed and you know ratified, uh, does ban certain types of AI, things like facial recognition, thing, uh, particularly in high-risk environments like law enforcement because of issues of bias and so on. Uh, but there's different levels of risk assessment. And then with those different levels, there's also different levels of regulation or ways to actually address and govern those technologies. Yeah. So we're taking a very kind of middle road, cautious approach. The United States, if we are to believe these documents, if they're actually going to act on these documents that we've seen on the suggestions, uh, it seems that they do want to surpass China. And the hypothetical that they don't, I imagine just the continual fall into decadence of the United States and Europe becoming essentially the uh, playground for China, where they come to visit because it's beautiful. And then they go back. Hmm. Okay. So then what? That's tricky. It's very tricky because when you have someone who doesn't play by the same rules, what do you do? I don't have an answer for that. It's a really tricky one. I'm not going to pretend to solve the China issue. Yeah, definitely not. Okay. Then yeah. So what exactly, can you give me some details about what they're doing over there? Yeah, so I mean, the Chinese state ain't no stranger to the powers of huge bodies with you know equally huge influence like we have back in the United States working with the intelligence communities, you know, Google. Uh, so it's no wonder that seeing the influence that big tech has on the West, China would crack down on how big tech uses its weight to influence its users, like uh, using recommender systems and other techniques that big tech giants have used to, you know, rake in the money and monopolize their power, but China won't suffer any other monopolistic powers. That's for sure. And they state that they have zero tolerance for corrupt behaviors, particularly those giants that actively try to consolidate power and capital uh, capital. So those trying to become monopolies, obviously the thresholds for this are super vague and we don't know how it's actually being implemented in China on a day-to-day basis. It's you know quite secretive and then we can't really trust what comes out. Still, we see that the consequences in, in the West of the unhindered growth of these giants, we already talked about that, and how they become political actors with their own agendas, uh, using the users as currency. You know, there's the saying, uh, if, uh, if you're not paying anything, for example, Facebook, well, then you're the product. And you know that's not to say that we should adopt the China the Chinese style of crackdowns, whatever that entails. Uh, I'm sure that would lead to a sort of mm, equally, if not more, detrimental overcorrection. That's usually what happens when people react is an overcorrection. But I, you, you hit on it. Something has to be done. I just don't know exactly what the best ways to separate these powers in the West are without risking that you know extreme overcorrection of just you know entirely dissolving them. Hmm. Okay. Well, I'm going to let other people deal with that problem. I think I'm going to, I'm going to deal with something else. That sounds a little too complicated. (laughs) Definitely. (laughs) That, yeah, that seems like a real problem. Can you, after, can you send me over links to those documents we were talking about earlier? Of course. You said they're online. Okay. I'll post those in the show notes. Yeah, that's and a great then, way. This is this is the only way, right? It's, we got to get people to realize this, to push back small acts of rebellion, right? Not expecting revolutions, but people say, no, I, I won't continue to use Facebook. I won't be uh, their currency, right? I won't give them the data that they'll then sell. Uh, then obviously to the intelligence agencies also who have full access to these, uh, to these systems. So it's, you know, making, getting people informed. And this is, this is one way. Is there a way that you can like, you you can give somebody your data and have it not be a bad thing? Like, is there any future where the government actually does something good with all the data instead of becomes tyrannical and something terrible happens? Like, I I mean, I assume that what they're doing and I assume that they don't think they're evil in China, right? They're like, no, this is for the benefit of all our citizens and there's going to be less suffering this way. Right. But we're freaking out about it. So how do we know that it's bad? Yeah, it, it's really 
I guess the point of view, you know, no other country in history has raised so many people out of poverty in a single generation. So you have to, you have to ask the question, do the ends justify the means? I'm highly skeptical of the centralization of power in general, uh, particularly when, uh, when everything is tied together in terms of our personal data, uh, when it's also tied to our ability to be financially independent and autonomous. And these are the discussions that are being had right now of centralizing our ability to transact with our vaccination status, um, with our perhaps what happens when you go to protest and the government doesn't like that protest? Well, we see the consequence of that. Can you imagine when all these things are far simpler because they're unified into a single system that they say is going to be highly secure? That's horseshit. Nothing is that secure. Someone can always get in. But that's not the, I'm not worried about the people getting in. I'm worried about the watchers who are actively using that. Yeah, no, that's definitely scary because what, like, what if things need to change, right? What if as a society we're doing something wrong and, you know, how do you even discover something new? Like I, you probably know I've done a lot of work with diet, which goes completely against mainstream, right? So how, yep. and just using that as an example, if we're all centralized like this, what happens when there's an outlier and they're like, oh wait, but maybe we should do this differently. It's like, no, cut that off. Easily. Does not, does that not seem exactly the point of these kinds of systems? They keep saying it's going to be so much more convenient as if it's so difficult for me to pull my license out of my wallet. You know, it's so heavy to carry around that I need a digital version of it. So now you have all my documents, you have the ability to access and to block my bank accounts. And then that's also tied with whatever new vaccination status you have, whatever that is. And then obviously, in terms of identifying people who hold uh, unacceptable views, right, being targeted, when you have the, the switch in your hand, so much easier. It seems like that's exactly the point. And we have the power in the East as a, essentially an example of how that's being played out. Hmm. Okay. So say these documents do get implemented. Is there, I mean, you must have thought about a timeline, like how long do we have before we turn into another China? Wow. I would say that if, if it's implemented the Chinese style system with these structural changes, as soon as those structural changes are made, uh, it's, you've passed the event horizon, everything becomes centralized. Now, can we actually make that transition? I, I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure if people realize, no, we're not going to do that. I think that there's a certain consciousness growing that's becoming skeptical of these times of measures. It seems that perhaps governments within the last year or so have pushed too far rather than taking an inch, they took a meter, right? So that kind of works against them. You take one step at a time and you're able to do that. This was hidden. Like I said, I'm not sure if the FOIA request was granted purposefully in order to acclimatize people to the idea, right? You saber rattle the people in the East and you go look at, if we don't even try doing this with against them, well, then we just become the, you know, the playground for China. No simple answer, but it is scary to consider what would happen because uh, I don't trust the, the nexus of power. Hmm. Okay, well, thank you very much for coming on my podcast. That was much more interesting. No, I appreciate than I was it was expecting. fun. Yeah, <laughs> that was fun. Um, if people want to find you or any of your information online, where should they go? Yeah, you could just toss my name in Google. You'll probably find uh, my website, probably use DuckDuckGo even better. Uh, and my institutional sites, if you're interested in the academic work. But uh, if you're interested in my forthcoming book, which was uh, written for a more general audience, like I mentioned before, it's called Design for Death, uh, Controlling Killer Robots about Autonomous Weapon Systems. And you can check that out on Trivent Publishing's uh, Ethics and Robotics book series. But if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can do so with the handle at Stephen Umbro and the IET with the handle at IET. Okay. Did you say your book was about, what did you say it was about? Autonomous killing machines? Yeah. Autonomous weapons. Yeah. Okay. Can you just describe what that is right before we end it? What does that mean? That sure. sounds awful. 
Yeah, it does sound it does sound awful. So for years now, this is kind of the Terminator scenario, but the book tries to get away from that Terminator scenario more generally because it gives a, a bad idea of uh, what our, uh, autonomous weapon systems are. And there's this trend towards more and more autonomy within the warfare theater. And, you know, we've seen that since uh, the Middle Eastern wars, the, the trend towards more and more drone strikes. It seems that's the that's the norm rather than the exception. So the question of what is a, a fully autonomous weapon system is, well, no longer does the human actually physically control uh, the system in terms of target selection and engagement, but the system is able to identify targets and then engage them autonomously. So that is what an autonomous weapon system is. And of course, there's different levels of autonomy, just like there's different levels of autonomy even within AI. So these are these are the questions that I explore. I try to find a middle path because uh, my, the argument in the book is that if we just try to ban these outright, like go oh, no t- no autonomous weapon systems whatsoever, then those states that are designing them simply won't sign the international agreements and use them anyway. But if we find the middle path of saying maybe these ones we shouldn't do and these ones are acceptable if we design them for values like the laws of armed conflict, then maybe those state actors who have an interest in developing these types of systems will be more likely to sign on to these international treaties and respect them. Okay. I like that. Seems like a, that seems like a good thing to write. Hopefully the bad guys read it. <laughs> okay. Thank you again for coming on. That was enjoyable. <laughs>